All in favor say, oh, we kind of got off track here. Aye, okay. Um, do I, I have a motion to approve the minutes of 12 3. That was where Milt was here and describing his two roles. His two roles, yeah. Do you, any of you remember those minutes? Do you want to wait until next time to approve them? Do you want to reread those? It's been a while. Excuse me, how do they accept the, the, the minutes when they don't even know what the hell is in the minutes? Well, they, they, they have the minutes. Do, they, you got a copy? No, yeah. Rudy, um, Come I do. On, let's it was, it was, we, we, we were just talking whether or not to accept them, Rudy. So That's what I'm we, have, we have the one from 1210, I mean, but not the one from 1230. No, we saw them. She sent it in an yeah, email to us. She didn't make a copy, though. Rudy, this yes. is the process that I, I do. Yes. I send them the minutes. Yes via the email, yes. so they can read them before they come to the meeting, okay? Oh, you send it to Yeah, I send it to everyone. Oh, I send it to Andrew, to Karen, to know. the select board, to everybody around this table. And they were sh they should have been approved the previous meeting, okay. but they weren't because okay. we did other okay. business. And if you can't remember, if you would like to wait till next week to approve the 12 free minutes, I'm fine with that. It's been a while. Okay. So we're short. Thank you, Danny. And we're up to date. So I guess tonight's first on the agenda is a presentation by the White Bottle Regional Airport. Yeah. Very good. Um, I'm Jay Ennis. Uh, I'm the chairman of the Airport Commission. Yeah. I'm Wendy Arvidsson. I'm the treasurer and secretary for the commission. And Wendy's been here several times. We appreciate it. Very good. Uh, so I uh, believe Wendy is handing out uh, just a couple of pages that we have for you that uh, summarize uh, the status of the airport, things that have been going on in the past year. Um, I'll bring you up to date. I'm really just going to be going through this, and at any point, if anyone has any questions, uh, I would just interrupt and we'll answer them then. <clears throat> so, uh, first of all, uh, I'm starting out this with a uh, just a, a collection of facts that I pulled together from the airport uh, operations from this year uh, to sort of say where things are for us. Uh, First of all, we had more than 250 aircraft visiting the airport in 2019. And in comparison to previous years, that's up 33% from where it was in 2018. Um, up even more from 2017. So you can see it's a, it's a very weather-related kind of thing. I mean, if we have a year of bad weather on weekends, that will push the, uh, the airport usage down somewhat. Uh, but uh, we've had great weather in the past couple of summers and uh, usage has been quite up. A uh, particularly interesting statistic for us is that 20% of the visits to the airport in this past year have been for business purposes. And that's up 59% from the, the previous year. Uh, we get this information by uh, using a, a sign-in log that uh, pilots are requested to sign in when they come. And we do ask them some questions about, uh, you know, why they're they're visiting, or is it, you know, pleasure purposes, business purposes, um, and we also ask them what towns they're visiting. Uh, not many people ever provide that information, but we see Littleton's name down there quite a bit uh, in the times that they do. And let me just interject. I also um, primarily the person that answers the phones and responds to phone calls. And it's a lot easier when you have a conversation with people to ask about why they're visiting. Um, and I can say that, generally speaking, I probably respond to a half a dozen phone calls a week. And across the board, um, I've been keeping track because I ask specifically since Littleton has requested this information. 80% of those people are at least going to visit Littleton if they're not staying in Littleton. So another piece of information is that uh, we're seeing quite an uptick in small and medium-sized jets and turboprops. So these are the, you know, the aircraft that uh, you know, executive type people might uh, use to try and come to the area. Um, that, I don't have any specific numbers, but one of the things that we've, we're seeing there is that the, uh, in years past we had talked about the need to extend the runway and to get an additional navigation system at the airport. 
And those things are really no longer necessary because the aircraft uh, that are being used today are capable of getting into our airport just fine. So we're no longer interested in a longer runway, no longer interested in that uh, navigation system because GPS has replaced the need for that. Uh, we had one weekend where we had, a, what was the number of jets on the runway at one time? Five. Yeah, so it, uh, it was a major deal. Um, in 2019, our aviation gasoline sales uh, were up uh, more than 20% over 2018. We sell about 12,000 gallons a year uh, right now. Um, there are 27 aircraft based at the airport, um, and hangar space is constantly in demand. Uh, we have a couple of people who are talking about building additional hangars at the airport, which means that the airport will be able to lease land to them and be able to get a little bit more revenue as a basis for that. Uh, excuse me, uh, is the, are the new leases, are they going to be uh, more, I guess, market-based as opposed to some of the old or well, when you say market, right? When you say market-based, even the old the old leases are market-based because they have clauses in them that say that we, you know, that they have to be brought up to market rate. The FAA requires that, um, and so when we do a comparison, as we're required to do every two years, three, three years, um, we go around and look at all of the other airports in the Northeast uh, area and build a spreadsheet and say what our lease rates are based on that. And there's a cap, it's similarly situated airports, so we can't like use Logan as an example. <laughs> so just for clarification, I mean, we are a general aviation airport, um, and you look at run runway length and facilities to com for comparisons. But there is, a, there is a new lease, and anybody will get the lease that we've been using for several years, and, um, and it's at the, you know, the top of the range that we're allowed to charge. Thank you. Um, the Civil Air Patrol, uh, which if you're not aware is the United States Air Force Auxiliary, has reconstituted a squadron at the airport now and has based an, an aircraft at the airport. Um, that aircraft and the, the squadron um, engage in search and rescue activities and a cadet program. So we've started a, a cadet program that uh, uh, now has 12 cadets that we're training in various STEM subjects and aviation and giving them orientation rides and you know, getting them into uh, aviation as a, as a possible career. Uh, the goal obviously with the Civil Air Patrol would be to grow that and get uh, uh, fairly large numbers from all the schools here. Uh, we've talked in the past about the National Guard. Uh, the National Guard is uh, still pursuing building a remote training facility at the, uh, at the airport, which basically means that uh, they, they would uh, um, have a facility that they can use on the weekends uh, and, and other times when they are conducting exercises in this area. Um, if they do that, uh, the airport would derive some operating revenue from them. And if the airport starts to offer jet fuel, uh, they would use the jet fuel at the air airport, which would, of course, benefit the airport's operating budget. And with respect to where that process stands, um, they've done an archaeological survey. Um, they've done an environmental survey. So they're in their federal process. So it's not like at this point, the intent is there to do it. And they're moving forward with it. And they've taken numerous steps to get there. And we are at the point where they're talking about starting entering into a lease for a section of the land. Um, in terms of just uh, other things that we're proud of this year, there was an, uh, an airport navigation aid uh, at the airport which has fallen into disrepair in recent years and the FAA was starting to view as a, as a safety issue. And uh, it was refurbished by volunteers um, and saving the airport about $20,000 over what contractors are going to ask. And then finally, we have the uh, fourth annual uh, airport fly-in, which we put on to promote the airport and uh, bring attention to our airport for pilots all across uh, the Northeast region and to you know, give a little bit back to local citizens and let them uh, come and visit their airport and get some value out of it day, day to day. Um, we attracted more than 5,000 people to this uh, airport because we had a fly, a, uh, an air show. Uh, and uh, the biggest question we had is, are you doing one next year? Because a lot of people up here had never seen an air show before. This was the first one up here in, in over 30 years. 
And I want to mention oh, just one thing with regard to that. Um, that air show and, and fly-in is put on completely with business sponsorship. None of the airport's funds are used for that. And in fact, uh, you know, funds raised by the, this fly-in go back to benefit the airport. So we're doing everything that we possibly can to uh, promote and grow the airport. Any questions on any of those points? Sure. I'm sorry, maybe in the handout I didn't see, I don't have it. You said that the 20% of the visits are business related, and that's up what from last year? It's up 59% uh, from 2018. I'm particularly interested in, the, uh, obviously, any traffic there is good, but I'm particularly interested in the business visit sure. because I feel like that's where we're going to get the most uh, value uh, as a, as a, uh, by, the, by the community as a whole. So I guess I have a question. You said you're, not, you're no longer interested in a longer runway. I understand that's because of new technology doesn't require it. One reason, yeah. One, one of the reasons. But my understanding is that particularly business aircraft are getting bigger all the time. Are you going to run the risk of not attracting business travelers I, because I, of the air? I guess I would differ with you on business aircraft getting bigger all the time. Okay. There are certainly much bigger business aircraft. Sure. But those are typically being used to move you know, 15, 20, 25 people from a company across an ocean. And any company business that has an aircraft of that size also has smaller aircraft that they use much more economically to go into different places around this country. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's far more common for there to be five and seven seat, even jet aircraft that are uh, operating all over the East Coast and in our airport. We saw many of those in the past year. Where's the break? Where, do you know what the break, breaking point is in terms of how big it has to get before it can? So um, we typically don't see anything more than, than a nine-seat jet that comes into our airport. And in talking to many of the crews that, uh, that bring these jets in, they haven't seen that they've ever had to you know, not come to our airport because of it. Because most often people are coming from within um, you know, five states, you know, the, the Midwest, uh, the Southeast. So and just to further that point, um, one of the things that the industry is recognizing is that there are 550 commercial airports in this country. There's over 5,000 general aviation airports that are much more localized um, to areas. So airplane ma aircraft manufacturers are actually building um, more jets that are smaller that can land in those kinds of places um, because it's much more accessible than larger aircraft. And as of 2000, the end of 2017, there were over 3,000 jets that could land at our airport every day of the week um, with maximum fuel, which most jets don't fly with maximum fuel capacity because of the additional costs. Okay. Um, so one of the things that we have looked at and we're going to continue to pursue is putting in a jet fuel farm um, because that will allow aircraft to land with a lower capacity of fuel so that those 3,000 go up exponentially um, by not having to carry maximum weight. And you had mentioned that previous years. Yeah. Um, and just, I mean, and, and I can say that there's, um, we've seen a couple of aircraft that are regularly flying in that are the newer jets. Um, for example, the Embraer Phenom is coming in. Um, there's somebody who flies in for business purposes a few times um, a year met him and there's also there was also um, um, a beach craft that came in for business purposes so those are the some of the newer jets um, that are being marketed in, in for, just for this purpose and okay, I, that's, I, I certainly have no first-hand knowledge I probably never will I'm just going based on an article I saw on manufacturers and what they're doing that's not what I understood that's yeah. good how many how many flights did you say in, in 2019? I think the number was 49. Thank you. So where is the nearest airport, local airport, to your airport? That someone could use if they weren't using ours? Yeah. Berlin, which is actually about 10 miles north of Berlin in Milan. Yeah. And and with that being said, it's also right next to a river. 
So part of the problem with the Berlin Airport is it's frequently fogged in because of um, the river. The humidity from the river comes up. So they have their, the ability to get in and out of that airport um, is much reduced compared to Mount Washington. I was trying to get a sense of where the smaller airports were. Mm -hmm. So after that, there is, there's another airport in Haverhill, but they're much smaller than us, and they would not be able to land a lot of the aircraft that Mount Washington can land. And east-west, Conway has one probably? Conway has Freiburg. It's in Freiburg. It's actually in Maine. Maine yeah. um, and going into Vermont. It's Caledonia. Caledonia. And, and Dean Memorial in Haverhill, it, it, you, you could barely land a pickup truck there. You have a pickup truck? <laughs> it's, it's very small. It's, it's, it's significantly smaller and, and not anywhere near as good repair as Mount Washington. We've been hearing for years about the goal is to extend the runway and get a jet fuel facility. And then very recently, and I can't remember my source, probably Dave or I don't know. But, okay. yeah. um, that there isn't room to extend the runway anyway. That, that if you wanted to. So, so that's not entirely true. Um, the issue with extending the runway is it would be extremely expensive. Um, it would involve, it would have to involve relocating the road that currently services the airport. Um, it's doable. I mean, it's, you know, with enough money, anything's doable. Um, but at this point, but at this point, it's, it's not likely going to happen. Um, because of the cost involved and with the change in the technologies. Um, the way the runway was extended previously, it was largely through an FAA grant. They pay 90% of all of the capital improvement projects, but it's doubtful that the FAA would sponsor um, a, a grant that large given the fact that the airport services um, the type of aircraft they expect it to service now. Um, and what the forecast is for us to continue to service it to get to a, to get to the five thousand the magical five thousand feet, which then you're learning you're, you're landing commercial aircraft with millions and millions of dollars. And sounds like completely unnecessary. Um, it, it doesn't appear that it would be necessary. I mean, we can certainly service air taxi service. That, like you know, there's a lot of turboprops that still burn jet fuel, like um, Pilatuses, which are probably the workhorse of the charter industry. Um, there are more Pilatuses and King Airs that are used for charter services than any other type of aircraft. Um, you know, we're not servicing a Boeing 777. <laughs> it's just, it's not gonna happen. And there isn't a need for it. So um, realistically, the, the, what we are seeing is charters that oh, people are charting planes for tourism and that is actually increasing and the charter service industry um, is kind of the fastest growing aviation industry currently. Um, they, they are, every year are going up between four and seven percent over the last five years and the forecast is that's going to that trend is going to continue and i think that's what we're seeing and we're in line with that in terms of what we're seeing at the airport we recently all received a letter uh from that was uh written by Rodebeck uh, mm -hmm. executives that their interest in flying in rather than driving yep and uh so is there anything that needs to be done to help facilitate that or can they do that right now with their they can do that currently um, probably the only thing that would really help in terms of facilitating and we've made some inroads in this area too is ground transportation from the airport to locations um, but there are two taxi services now that will regularly service the airport and, and we know how uber is making its way to, to the north country the uber uber. driver yeah so that's helpful as well and i neglected to put down here that we now have a reliable rental car capability at the airport this year we didn't have last year so we've been able to partner with a rental car company so that's helped a great deal you know, it seems like last year um, the objection to the petition article is that other communities aren't pitching in so why should we <coughs> right I think I, so that, that was one of the sentences yes. the john washington hotel yeah we assume that the hotel has guests that fly in I mean, do you have any data on that they do i mean the mount washington certainly has a fair number of the people who fly in who, who spend time at the mount washington as well as the mountain view yeah. Um, but, but that's not exclusive for sure. Um, I can tell you, I've talked to like, a number of people who come in and stay at Thayer's, who stay at the Hampton. It just really depends on what their interests are. Um, we, get a, we get a lot of hikers um, that will stay in the more of the, the smaller community hotels 
um, around the area. Do either of those communities contribute? But Whitefield, well, Mountain View is in Whitefield, so of course Whitefield does. Um, the town of Carroll has not. Um, we are looking at putting on a budget, like a warrant article for them to join the IMA. I think the, the issue with um, the town of Carroll has been over the past is there is a small private airport in Carroll, so some of the folks have a sentiment of, well, we have our own airport, why do we need to con contribute to Mount Washington? Um, what they don't understand is that airport is in like very bad disrepair and most people won't fly in there. It's actually closed. Oh, is it closed right now? No. Yeah. So that, that has been a change. And I have had conversations with a couple of the selectmen over there who are supportive of the airport and are looking for the town to do something are to support the Are you going to bring more article yet? That's the plan. Unfortunately, we're back to the, the age-old issue of we're a bunch of volunteers that only have so much time to put into it, and it's a, it's, it's a lot. I mean, we do a lot of time. I mean, I put in probably 15 to 20 hours a week um, in managing the airport, and I, I also have a full-time job, so it's a little hard to kind of keep going with that. And we don't get a lot of support from any of our member towns in terms of help with those kinds of day-to-day -day stuff, so. Do we have a representative from Littleton? You do, you do. Is it Dayton? It is. It's Unfortunately, he has been. Yeah, he has. Um, he has not been able to attend meetings for a while because he had, I, um, he had a bad car accident, so he's not driving. But um, mm -hmm. he's regularly updated on, on the kind of what's going on. So are there any other <coughs> towns that are paying their um, dues, if you will, or support of no. the airport? No, the, the member town, all the member towns pay their dues except. But, but, but Frank only and Bethlehem would be on the list too. Okay. In list, correct? Yes. Um, Franconia had been a member town, but they they had stopped paying for a number of years. So, pursuant to the terms of the IMA, they were they're no longer a member. Um, and Bethlehem is certainly another one. But like every town, everybody is not looking to spend more money. So well, that's you know part of the. But, that, but as with us, you know, the amount that's being asked for and the area commitment that's being looked for. I mean, uh, you know, there's a lot of money spent on a lot of things more than more than this. So, I mean, it really, any area of town, at least, you know, my opinion, and obviously, I always refer back to Bert Ingerson, who was led the, mm -hmm. the drive of the town for Lutheran, who was, like, it's a significant area resource and needs to be supported. But having said that, obviously, I, I'd say that Frank Oney and Bethlehem could not, it would be nice if they would be joining also. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chairman, also, I mean, we could have thought for, Karen and I just talked about it, we could, draft an uh, additional warrant article language for you. That'd be so, great. And then you That'd be great. Put it on a form and drop it off at the gas stations or something, wherever people want to be. Well, I think with respect to the town of Carroll, I, I, my, I, we, we did try to get them to put it on, uh, let us let them to put it on, as opposed to a petition warrant article. Mm -hmm. um, and two years ago, we thought they were going to, and then somebody changed their mind at the last minute. But there has been a shift in the board. Um, and I know that two of the selectmen right now are supportive. So. Um, we have to go before them and see if they'll put it on themselves as opposed to a petition article. Um, which the key would probably would be in Franconia and Bethlehem, there's got to be an aviation enthusiast in each of those towns. That's what some of you Well, Franconia actually has two pilots um, that are based at the airport that live in the town. So, I mean, I think I would give mm -hmm. it to them to sure. get the 30 signatures or whatever it is that's required yep. uh, and, and to speak to it at the. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, here's the uh, I had one question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, your hangers that you lease out the property that are built. Yes. Those are taxed by the town, correct? Yes. So, so the Whitefield received those taxes. Yes. So the way the airport works is the land is all owned by the airport. It cannot be sold um, pursuant to the FAA grant assurances that the, the um, airport has entered into. The buildings on that sit on top of the land are individually owned, and those are taxable properties. Um, and the town of Whitefield, just so you know, um, under the terms of the intermissal agreement, the support from each town is based on a per capita basis. Um, even with that, the town of Whitefield typically pays three times their per capita share. So they are paying significantly more than any other member town. And they also help us with in-kind services. For example, um, the town crew plows the runway. So we, that we've been able to reduce our um, snow removal costs but with their assistance. Are you a nonprofit? 
We are not, we are, but we're not a for-profit because we're considered a municipal entity. We have looked into, and I'm kind of working on that to see if we can make the airport a non-profit while maintaining the municipal status um, because of the international agreements a little bit trickier, uh, but that's something that we are working on currently as well. Now, under IRS standards, you may be able to get a letter from the IRS that allows individuals or companies to donate. We can do that. For we, we already can do that. Um, the issue is a lot of companies, unless you actually have that 501c3 status, they won't do it. Um, even though that it is ta it is tax deductible, um, under the new tax rules, I'm not really sure anymore because a lot of that has changed with our current president. Um, but again, that's something that um, we are exploring. Companies are probably going to put that under advertising anyways. That's, that's true. Yes, sir. Uh, this is going to be a one article, so it's, uh, it's going to go onto the top now. Petition, I believe. Uh, no, no, no. It's, it's going to be a board. 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 Okay. One article? Yeah. It's going to be a one article? Yes. Okay. It's, uh, yeah. I will have to say uh, one day, if you don't mind. One day. One day. <laughs> it's going to put it pretty well. Anyway, I'm involved with that for 40 years. I've just retired and moved up here. Okay. I got a pilot license. I worked for British Airway for 40 years. I went to take, you know, a look out at the airport, which is not bad. It's not an airport. It's a land strip. That's what it is. It's a strip that people land and they go. But what I like about it is that you guys can make a lot of money over there. Because I see, I went in a couple of angles, and you guys do a lot of overall engine. That's the main when somebody does over all, you gotta have an instructor, you gotta have somebody that sign, you gotta have somebody that make the plane fly, you know, take it ready to fly. And, you know, I'm not trying to be taken, but uh, the point is this, what, who, who's gonna benefit from the money that you guys ask for, the taxpayer over a little time? Who's gonna benefit from that? Mount Washington, that's where they're gonna be. Benefit. You're not going to benefit us? Why fear? Oh, yes. sure. Yeah. It, it, I guess if, if I, I it's, would, it's not a lot of money that you guys asked. Just $8,000, whatever it is. $6,000. Well, that's $6,800. Okay. It's, it's okay. Because last year, right, you know, nobody voted for it. Okay? And <laughs> it maybe it's going to have the same thing this year because, you know, it's very really, late. Uh, you guys not do not take it for a little time, not take it all. Really. Say again. You say guys not do not take it for the good or good time. Rudy, I don't think you can say that. Yes, I, I, I have a few statistics I would like to share with you on that that uh, that uh, run counter to that. But uh, you, can I proceed with sure. the information I have down here? And we'll get to that when I put it up. Jerry, um, there's there's a couple components that might strengthen. Uh, a Warren article or something. And I don't see a list here, so maybe it was presented last year or the year before. But a um, educational component mm -hmm. and a recreational component for the region. So, so I, I guess what I'm wondering is if there isn't currently those, are you looking towards maybe having a learn to fly program or a um, I know you have the fines, so that's educational. Mm -hmm. you know, kids the Civil Air Patrol is really the learn to fly capability that we have. Okay. And so when a cadet joins the Civil Air Patrol, uh, they get five flights paid for by the Air Force in a powered aircraft here at our airport. Yeah. And they get five flights paid for in a glider, in a glider that happens over in Vermont. And uh, kids that want to pursue uh, an aviation rating on a pilot's license can do so through the Civil Air Patrol on the Civil Air Forces or the, the, on the U.S. Air Forces bill, and so we're trying to grow this program um, from uh, basically a, a, a standing start in September. We have 12 students now, and I think we will be able to grow that year by year now that we've got the commitment and an aircraft up here you know, at the airport. So I think there's a substantial thing that we're starting to do for educational purposes up here. Um, as far as um, you know, other things, recreational as an example, there are limitations about what the airport is allowed to do based on the fact that this is uh, you know, land that is 
uh, on a FAA-funded Grand Assure airport. We can't, for instance, you know, open up a McDonald's, uh, you know, on it, uh, you know, and, and just. I was thinking more of. Uh, I know Franconia has, you know, a couple planes you can you know, pretty much drive fly right through the notch. And so, and down, oh, and, down, and, and so there is. Down, so, so, down, so, so there is. Down, so there is it's like a sunset ride. You, Right, and we have that. I think we have that as well. One of the businesses that operates out of our airport is a helicopter tour company, yeah. and uh, they do a year-round business of, of taking people through the notch and over, you know, over the mountains and everything else. Uh, I think it's a significant draw to our airport at this point, and we would love to attract more like that. When you mentioned kids, what age group are you talking? Twelve to eighteen. Twelve to eighteen. Yeah. Um, and and we, I've also made I've also done some preliminary research into creating a STEM program with the high school as part of the career and technical education component. Like Mon Regional. Yeah, which is tied into Littleton because they do a trade around, yeah. so that some wow. of the some of our students come here, some of your students go up there. Mm -hmm. um, so there is sort of a model for that, um, and it's something that the CTE director Rob Scott and I are um, planning to talk about more. Because the other thing that is happening is in the next decade, the airline industry is going to have a shortage of about 100,000 pilots. Um, so they are right now kind of scrambling because the pilots are aging out, and as they retire, there are not new pilots to replace them. So there will be a significant, I don't know if anybody's seen, like particularly the Delta CEO has been very vocal about the need for more people in the aviation industry. Um, so it's another way that with having this piece of infrastructure in our communities that we may be able to use that as a way to get <coughs> kids involved in something that's not drugs, um, for one, and for two, that's very positive and provides, you know, a really good career path that with good jobs that are, you know, have benefits and, and make money and, you know, they're not, I mean, with all due respect, with no disrespect intended, but, you know, the minimum wage jobs at box stores. Right. I, I know a young woman um, who is a junior in high school um, up in Canada that through her ROTC she was able to get her pilot's license. Mm -hmm. And you can so, do the same thing with civil air patrol. That is absolutely possible. It's a goal. I mean, it's, yeah. it's what and we want to come out of it. And both yeah. Jay and I are involved in the civil air patrol. It's they wild. actually had 12 young women and 12 young men in the program and I think all but two graduated. This is why the Air Force funds this. Is yeah. it, it is a you know, a way of bringing people up into a possible Air Force career. Twelve to eighteen, and then the age is twelve. And I think right now the average age of the kids, um, we have a couple of kids who are twelve. Most are fourteen. Yeah, and and they and it's more than just learning to fly. It's it, 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 it's an entire curriculum built around sort of like character development and integrity and really, um, you know putting the kids in a position where they take pride in what they do um, and then they, they, you know, and it's not just flying, it's, you know, drone flight, it's, it's technology. And actually the first orientation flight that we've given uh, for all the cadets was a Littleton resident who lives over by uh, the, the Dells, flew him over his house on Sunday. Right. You don't have a, a private aviation store, do you? Uh, there is a there is a private there is a um, there is a gentleman on field that will give pilot lessons. He is a certified flight instructor, and he's also a repair station. Yes. So repair station. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have somebody that you were able to do a deal with Light Mountain Regional? Do you have somebody who could actually teach that course? I'm not an aviation. So um, we can we can work on it. There are certainly there are a couple of pilots in the area. Um, one who just bought a house in the area and is going to be retiring from American Airlines and we have another local gentleman who will be retiring from Southwest in the next few years and has expressed an interest in becoming more involved. Um, so I think the answer is probably yes. I mean again it's a work in progress Mark, and I know that I know that um, Conway has just developed a similar program so it's not like we're reinventing the wheel. So there are a number of programs and I, I got a lot of information from one of um, the engineers who had applied to be the airport consultant um, and they've been very gracious about sharing things so there's a number of programs out there so it's not recreating it it's basically just taking someone else's and tweaking it for our use all right we should probably yeah. okay so i can go quickly through the next sections because i think we've talked about a lot of it before the operating revenue piece we said twelve thousand gallons 
where it says zero, zero, zero in operating revenue, if you please just add a six ahead of that comma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was on my screen for some reason, it just in print. Um, I don't know what happened there. We leased, at this point, 12 small parcels of land. Uh, that generates about $8,000 in, um, uh, in operating revenue for the airport every year. Uh, we talked about the one tenant that was uh, um, operating a tourism business and helicopters and the other one that operates a repair station. Um, we One question that was around last year at this meeting was uh, fees for visiting airport, you know, are other you know, visiting aircraft paying their fees? Um, so we, we charge fees for commercial and corporate airport airplanes landing uh, based on the size of those planes, so either $140 or $75 based on the weight. Um, and we charge overnight fees, so $65 for any of the commercial fees and 10 or, uh, 15 to $10 for private twin engine and single engine planes. And those are competitive rates with uh, other businesses everywhere, actually. That contributed about $2,000 to our revenue this year. Um, we also received donations each year, and we talked about the fly-in uh, being one of the you know, vehicles for that. Um, and I think we all understand at this point that the balance of the funds that are needed to operate the airport are what go to the, the member towns on a per capita basis through the, through the IMA. Um, that's all for operating the airport. For the capital improvement side of things, that comes from uh, the fact that uh, every gallon of aviation fuel that uh, is purchased at any airport um, of aviation gasoline is taxed at a dollar, a dollar a gallon. And that goes into a, an aviation trust fund and gets reallocated to the airports. And this airport accrues $150,000 a year uh, for capital improvements through the um, FAA's airport improvement program. Um, that requires uh, local matching, uh, in our case, 5% matching from, you know, from uh, the towns and Whitefield typically no not the, not from the towns the town of Littleton doesn't pay a penny towards capital improvements the only thing that is requested from the IMA from the member towns are operating expenses all of the capital improvements are funded um, by Whitefield and by revenue sources That's that the airport comes up with on their own um, a lot of that has been donations in the past so we work really hard to keep those numbers down as, as little as possible um, but the town, I just so for clarification, Littleton right. is not paying a penny to improve the airport. Mm -hmm. and, and Whitefield is. And Whitefield is. And, and how much approximately each year does Whitefield, so, or are they just separate Warren articles? How, what is that process? The, the town of Whitefield, so typically, um, it really, it, it varies because we get $150,000 in primary non-entitlement funds which are allocated from the FAA. There is a 5% match that is um, given by the state of New Hampshire, and then the remaining is a 5% local share. So for every $150,000 that the airport spends on a capital improvement, we have to match $7,500 or 5%. That $7,500 for the most part comes from the town of Whitefield. Um, they have been contributing roughly $6,000 a year over and above their IMA share, um, and that money gets put in a separate account for capital improvement projects. We don't do $150,000 every year. Um, there are years that, you know, for example, two years ago we did a runway rejuvenation project, which was about $400,000, but there had not been something done for like two years prior to that, because we have to sort of save up those primary non-entitlement funds. And so every year, Whitefield pays approximately $6,000 more than? That's correct. Over, so over every year. Above a share. Whether or not there is a capital improvement. Yes, and because it's into a fund. Yes, because what we're doing is we're setting that money aside to match our hundred and fifty thousand dollars every year. Um, so we're short about fifteen hundred dollars a year of the five percent match, um, and we have done different things in order to raise that money. I mean, one year we used some of the money, some of the a little excess from the event that was then put into that capital improvement fund to help pay for the runway rejuvenation project. We've done some in-kind services. For example, there's this thing called the DPE um, that has to be done that costs several thousand dollars. We did a bunch of that in-house so that we could use our work as part of the match. Um, so we have been pretty creative about ways to raise that $7,500 every year. But like this year, we didn't do a project. Next year, we have a project that we have some safety issues with obstructions that have to be cleared. Um, that project's going to be up two hundred thousand dollars, so our five percent match is obviously more. Um, so, like I said, we we keep that money separate and apart for our capital improvement fund. 
All right. Um, so as far as expenses go, just so you're aware, the major expenses to operate the airport um, are coming from electricity, 31%, airfield maintenance, 27%, and snow removal, 25%. Uh, that, that consumes most of what we do. Um, the airport has no direct employees, um, and the only has, we only have regular contracts for snow removal, mowing, and pool system maintenance. Most of the work on the airport is provided by the volunteers, and we do everything from repairing the airfield, lighting, to you know, filling cracks in the runway, and clearing brush, and doing the building maintenance. And the snow removal is non-runway snow removal. Um, so there's a combination of things. First, the town plows it to the side, but then it builds up on the side. That doesn't work, so the airport operates a large tractor with a blower that throws it over, and we have to clear uh, snow that builds up in different places on the airport. So we contract for that as, as contract labor. Um, so the next section I put together is you know, airport benefits to Littleton to really get to sort of the, the, the meat of this whole thing. One thing I did is went through 2018 tax data looking at who in Littleton is benefiting from the airport and what are their impacts on, on Littleton's taxes. And these are direct benefits, not indirect. When I say direct, I mean people who are actually flying into the airport have a business here. Um, as opposed to, you know, the businesses like the Shillings and the Thayers where people are staying, we're not talking tourism, we're talking direct benefits. Right. So between Littleton businesses and individual taxpayers that benefit from the airport and end up contributing almost 1% of what the town rate, it must raise in property taxes every year. Um, and that's like not just the airport contribution, that's like all of Littleton, like the entire Littleton budget. Yeah. Um, Second bullet, regional and national companies that do business in Littleton view the airport as being basic infrastructure, much the same way as they view roads and, and electricity. Uh, they, you know, when, when someone is looking to decide to base a business in the Littleton Industrial Park, one of the things they're looking for, besides how accessible is it from I-93, is how do I get my people there from all over the country? In the case of Robotech, uh, uh, Rotoback, I would say, Peppers, uh, you know, they're coming out of Quebec. And it takes them four and a half hours to get their executives here or to get any of their technical support people here. And so the conversations that we've had with them, they're interested in using the airport to get people here more easily. It'll take them, including a stop for customs on the, on the order of 45 minutes to get somebody here. It's a big difference. Um, and I, I would think that anybody who wants to, to build a presence in that industrial park is going to figure this out. Uh, the airport, uh, continues to attract affluent home buyers. Uh, I can't point to one that Littleton has received in the past couple of years, uh, but I can point to people that have landed in Dalton and Whitefield and Lancaster, and it's probably happened to Littleton, but I, they're not on my radar yet. And, and I can say specifically, I've looked up some of the Dalton pilots that have um, aircraft based at the airport and Dalton is getting a return of about $30,000 in taxes on their $1,400 investment. Um, because the folks that are building houses that are pilots, they're not building $100,000 houses, they're building $300,000, $400,000, $500,000 houses. So literally one person building a house in Littleton will more than double what Littleton pays in. And they're very unlikely to put anybody in your school. So you're getting their tax revenue with a, with a bonus, if you will. Um, so, I think we already talked about the fact that it's very difficult to track every visitor that comes to the airport and say, you know, exactly how many dollars do they spend in Littleton. But given that Littleton has the, the, the majority of the, the restaurants and shopping businesses in the area, it's very unlikely that someone is spending, you know, a week in, in this area and not coming to Littleton several times. The restaurants are here. The town's done a great job with that. The airport. Um, provides them with customers. And I think everybody knows here that the, the portion of the rooms and meals taxes come back to Littleton and last year over three hundred thousand dollars in rooms and meals taxes came back to the town of Littleton. So every tourist that comes here and eats out is giving tax dollars back to the town of Littleton. So I mean to close Littleton's IMA share uh, this year is uh, to be six thousand eight hundred and twenty seven dollars. It's down from what it was last year and that represents zero point zero four percent of what Littleton uh, at least last year, uh, appropriated. And so just 1% of 
of the business from the businesses and individual taxpayers are benefiting from that represent a 22,000 percent return on what Littleton puts into the airport or would put into the airport this year. So I think there's a return there. It's just not all tourism dollars, and it doesn't, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't show up as overtly as maybe you're looking for. Have you um, done any presentations with the um, industrial, I guess? Yeah, Helen, do you see? Yeah, have you, to them, to, you know, for their companies out there about the airport? I know they have monthly meetings, or don't no, they have meetings? I have been talking with Chamber of Commerce about doing that kind of, you know, doing that kind of presentation. And I, I know that they're somehow related with the industrial park. Yeah, I, I think that would be a good context. Mm -hmm. yeah. Love to do it. Does anybody else have any questions, comments, or thoughts either? <coughs> Bottom line is that this, the um, Board of Selectmen are putting a Warren article on for, uh, I don't know if you've approved it yet, but it's- We have, we, we tabled that. We tabled that. Wanted to hear it. Wanted to hear it. Actually, no, I'm sorry. We did decide to put it on. We got, obviously, we didn't sign the support of the program. Yeah. So That's for the amount of $6,847, is it? It was for the amount of 6200 but we will adjust that. It was just a point, yeah, we didn't have, I think at that point the budget wasn't completely still adjust that. Yeah. 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 And so we will, in our process, when we get to the Warren articles, uh, once we hear everything and get a grand scheme of everything, all the taxes, we go through the Warren articles and the, this committee will vote whether or not to support each Warren article. We won't do that tonight because we have to see the whole package still first. But well, just anyways. assuming that the budget committee and the select board, everybody's 100% in favor, which I think is probable, mm -hmm. uh, how will you get the voters to be enthusiastic about it? Is there any, and I'm asking this because I have a another Warren article that I'm really interested in, and we need the voters mm -hmm. to be enthusiastic about it, uh, not just the selectmen. I'm curious how it became a warrant article. I mean, so if you look at the original warrant article that uh, Littleton joined the intermunicipal agreement, it stated that it would be made part of the budget. That was in 2000. And in 2010, uh, it was reaffirmed by the voters as uh, you know, as a part of the budget. And somewhere along the lines in the past couple of years, it seems like you know the, the town uh, turned it back into a warrant article. I guess not. I think what, what ended up, what happened, the history of it, and I'm not, uh, not passing judgment whether it was right or wrong, there was a lot of controversy over whether to, that should be, we should be supporting that in the budget. So uh, previous board, decided to pull it out and let the people decide if they wanted to continue to support that. Well, the, the issue with that, and I'll, again, with all due respect, is that the townspeople, I don't, and maybe they don't care, but, but the problem is, is I don't think the townspeople understand that, you know, they voted to make this a, as part of the agreement and failure to appropriate the money yeah. boots them out, which is not the process by which the town voted on in the first place. If, yep. if the I, I town of Littleton know. wants to withdraw from the intermunicipal agreement, there's a mechanism to do that. Well, one of the mechanisms not, is not paying. Well, you, we you can keep that, that's, but I understand that. Yeah. But what I'm saying is I don't know that the voters of the town of Littleton know that. Yeah. And that's part of like that's I, that's part of our frustration is that, you know, this was put to the townspeople saying, hey, do you want to be part of Mount Washington Airport? Mm -hmm. And the people said, yes, we do. Um, but it didn't get put there that says, hey, do you want to be a part? But if we don't pay for a couple of years, then we're not going to be a part. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that people necessarily understand that once they're out, they're out. I think every now and then on everything, no matter what it is, it comes up for review. And it came up for review. And now we're, because we are interested and because we feel that through um, having this televised and, and having um, reporters come um, and write about it, that we are providing a mechanism for the community to learn about this again. So, I mean, that's as good as we can do right now. 
Um, you have a good question, how do you promote it beyond that? Um, you probably need to get people that write letters of support in the, in the paper. But it never hurts to review things, to see how things are being run. It just never hurts. So um, anyways, there are any other questions? Mm -hmm. One, okay. One other you. suggestion is be at the deliberative session so that you get your message out there what you feel the airport brings to the town of Littleton tax makers. Because they're gonna see there they're gonna be there, they're gonna spread the word, yes or no. Um, they will be the ones asking questions. Um, that that way you have a chance to promote it. And the non resident or non taxpayer can speak? You, speak. you have to be on the list. <laughs> and approved to be able to speak. But the last year, of course, where Dayton spoke in favor of it, and I spoke in favor of it, unsuccessfully, but mm -hmm. did. And well, here. Yeah. But, but it's... It's tough. Right? Yeah, yeah, getting it's people it's to, to understand. We, yeah, we do understand that, and I mean, but I think that what a lot of people sort of miss the point of is the airport, I've heard this for years now, that people think the airport's a business. It's not. It's infrastructure. It's no different than Main Street. I mean, it's just infrastructure for planes. Um, and, you, you know, it, it's, it's hard for us because we keep hearing, well, it's our message. It's not our message. This town is part of this agreement. This town supported this agreement. So it's not Jay and I that are asking for this money. This is something that the town of Littleton entered into willingly. And, you know, why we have to sell it to people who entered into it is something that's a little confusing to us, frankly. Um, and it's something that the town benefits from. You're not and then Main Street, and the only thing that, that gets reviewed over the years. Sure. Sorry, it's not, I, I, I thought it was your you not your line. line. <laughs> you know, that's, it's not a question of being reviewed, it's a question of people understanding yeah. that, again, it is a piece of infrastructure for this region. I mean, our, our feelings would not be hurt at all if you put a warrant article that said, do you want to stay in the intermunicipal agreement? Right. I mean, we, we really just want to try and figure out how to operate the airport within the terms that we have set forward well, and but, but I think there's a question whether it was wise to pull it out to begin with I understand that mm -hmm. the problem is where we where we are today is sure. where we are we can't have had it pulled out have it voted down and then stick it in the budget and then not and then we, we would take a weapon for that okay if it does pass and I and I after tonight's meeting I can tell you as, as a selectman I will support it if it does pass, I think then there's a legitimate discussion for, to get it back into the operating budget and keep it there as part of the in infrastructure, that, that, as you as you said. But the problem is where we are. We are where we are now, mm -hmm. and, okay. and we can't. That's fine. Do we have to deal with it as it stands today? Right, right or wrong, we do have a strong history of letting people vote for things. So that's that's mainly it. Is there? Well, we have a history here too of. Um, we had a huge cut. Um, how many years ago was that? Uh, 2011? 2011, it was huge. And so a lot of things, our police cruisers are out on a Warren article, our road improvements are out on a Warren article. Everything is out on a Warren article because we've given the, the community an opportunity to um, vote on them. Um, so everyone is kind of trying to regroup and wondering how to get back into the budget, so sure. it isn't a separate Warren article. So I don't know if wording has to be part of the Warren article to be placed in the operating budget from now on, um, so we don't have to go through this. I think, I think that's a problem for next year. I don't see that that has to be in this Warren article because that would just, to me, okay, that would make it even tougher. Yeah. Okay. All right. I was just wondering. If, all right. Oh, yeah. I think. Okay. I, I think. What to me, what's reasonable is. If it passes uh, next year, assuming I'm still around, <laughs> the, uh, that we, we put it in it and we and we explain why it's a part of the operating budget and, and yeah and, and and support it that way instead of you know, running it through that tail turn. Always good to know how it affects how that uh, promotes Littleton. So and that's well, we have no problem on. giving that information. That's not that that's yeah. not the frustration at all. Like, yeah. just that that's, you know, we're, we're happy to. But it's much stronger, and much better explanation this year, which is very much appreciated. So that's 
Well, we have to. Yep, that's fine. Gary, before I turn this. Yeah, I, just, I guess as we're sitting here thinking, um, air travel is going to be the way of the future. I think it is going to be quicker, more efficient, and we're going to see a lot more of it. Now, we as a town could go out towards the Ward Farm, towards Monroe, and build our own airport for millions of dollars. <laughs> so my thought is 6,000 some odd change per year to support what's already in place is a very good investment. It's a good way to get a pass and do the option. Before you go build your own airport, um, you, you'll want to take a look at one statistic that there have been very, very few small airports built in the last 40 years. More have been lost. Sure. And that's the, that's the bigger concern that... And, and I will tell you this. FAA is not going to give you the money to build a new one because no. you got one right here. Good. Yeah. So it's going to be all on bolts and stein. <laughs> that's just so, not going to happen. So uh, yeah, you know, that's the reason it's not all vacant. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, okay. Thank Thank you. you very much for everything. Much appreciated. Thank, Thank, Thank you for the detail. When's the deliberative session? When is it? February. <coughs> no, is it that late now? Oh, yeah. no, February, uh, a month you before we find it before. Uh, somewhere around February. February 4th. Yeah. February 4th. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Ah, would you like to come on? Sure. <laughs> so who, who are the players here? Who's, who's on the budget? Right. You'll find that out later. <laughs> 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 yeah. so who else? <laughs> All of us around the table. You? No, I'm, I'm an office employee. <laughs> you, you, you. More than an office employee. <laughs> <right? laughs> You're on? Yeah. You're not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you need information on these. I mean, the most of the time. I know the numbers are really small. And you're on? Thank you. 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 Yeah, I mean, there you go. Actually, I've got, so I got really cheap with the third piece of paper. And I, uh, I did print it. <laughs> Probably the most important piece. But, uh, sure, the third piece is I Okay, I'm Kathy Bentley. Um, I'm a nurse, so I run the first house. Uh, Shelter Veterans Advocacy in Plymouth, and I've been, uh, I was a volunteer when, um, when I was actively a nurse, and, and, um, and then in 2009, uh, job search was done, and um, the guy, I, the surgeon I was working for, who was my husband, um, retired and started to work at the hospital, and I went, okay, and I ended up becoming the director, the interim director in 2009, and I'm still the director of the Bridge House. So I think, um, do you, anybody here know Rob Norris? No. No. So you have a CBOC in Littleton, isn't that, is that correct? Community, a CBOC? Community-based outreach? It's a, it's a veterans clinic. Oh, okay. So it's the only one, no, it's the closest one north of Plymouth is here in Littleton. So very often our vets in Plymouth come up to your CBOC here, and it's run by White River Nation. So Community-based based, um, out It's community-based um, outpatient. Yes. At, What's the C? At cottage, the one at the old cottage hospital. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. So we had a very important outreach person in Rob Norris who's an MSW from White River Junction because he served all of this area in, in New Hampshire. If you look on the first page, 
this housing for our formerly homeless veterans opened up in September in Plymouth. It actually, I wanted it to serve all of Grafton County. Well, Rob became the person who is now there almost full time. He's there daily. So um, you don't have an active MSW um, advocating for any veterans who are facing homelessness up in this region as far as I know. So that's one of those Peter principal things, unfortunately. Um, so anyway, um, I'm just, so for years I've been sending out uh, letters to all of the municipalities in Grafton County asking them if um, they would, you know, create a warrant article to provide $2,000 to the bridge house. And um, based on our service to people who've been in the military. And so if you've been in the military, uh, we don't ask you where you're from. We say, you know what, you, you swore allegiance to this Constitution. You don't serve a town, you serve the Constitution. And so when you show up at Bridge House, we will take you in and provide all the services. And the VA made a commitment to end veterans homelessness in 2015. And so we've been able to connect veterans to those services more rapidly than any other services for other people experiencing homelessness. <laughs> so um, the other thing we did is um, people in the military are the only people who can bring their dog or cat to the beach house. We had to increase our, our um, insurance. We had to uh, choose a different policy, but felt it was worth it um, because there are a number of, um, I'll call them vets, um, who were in the woods and pickup trucks with their best pal. Fido or Fluffy or whatever. So anyway. So is the Bridge House solely for veterans? No. Bridge House is an equal opportunity, everybody shelter. We serve a lot of the big people who get out of Grafton County, um, especially with the opioid crisis. Um, I wanted to be Grafton County only. I approached the state a couple years ago and asked, what if we just serve Grafton County for citizens and anybody in the military, that would be across the board. Anybody would get in who had served in the military. And they said no one's ever tried it. This past summer, everything changed with the state, so our funding has been slashed almost to zero. Only the big shelters will be pretty much funded from now on. It's based on a per head, per capita amount for the state at $11. So places small like the Bridge House are probably going to not see much funding. Um, we were used to getting about $140,000 a year. My budget is about four hundred and forty. dollars so that was a big chunk of our budget. Um, if we see 30000 this year, we'll be lucky, but that's opened the door for me to, if I get a call from Manchester National and you haven't been in the military, I can give you all the information for all the other places down there, but I don't feel um, we're, being, we're being taped, aren't we? So anyway, so um, you know, I feel like as long as we're just serving people in the military, um, no matter what, we are we are meeting our mission. Do you receive any money from the county? Um, we receive uh, twenty-five thousand dollars, another competitive grab from Grafton County. Yep. And I, and if you look at the third page, you'll see that um, Plymouth, another, it's another competitive grant that. I have to submit, and that's 13000 and that's by far the largest. Um, did you get a third page? I it's don't got think a list so. of. It's, no, thank you. I'm right I here. do now. Thank you. Yeah, so, yeah, that's got the list of. That's not it. No. This right here. Yes, so that's that's the giving from. Uh, so all the municipalities receive a request, and that is the last the last tally. So it's by for capita that you make the request, or is it a flat rate? So you? what you see on page two is the um, request I sent to your welfare officer. And those were the people we served from Littleton. Um, there were eight, 80 days for one person, 14 for another. Um, we had our programs evaluated in 2010, Soldier On out of Pittsfield, Mass, said that we were providing services that are, you know, the value then was $75 a day. Well, that was nine years ago. So I think it's fair to say it's 100. And what I ask welfare offices to do is to consider 25% of that total amount, but to send what they can. I get it that towns are strapped. So I have been more successful at um, explaining what we do for people who've been in the military um, and getting this money that you see there based on the warrant than I have been with sending an account of who we served 
from that town to the welfare officer, I would say maybe 10 or 15 percent of the towns respond to that. But there's certainly, you know, in, in my business, getting 36,000 36, from all these municipalities is really good. So this like is it. the first year that you've approached Littleton? I've sent Littleton a letter every year. I've never gotten a request to come and talk about it. Every single, um, around Thanksgiving in the fall, every municipality in Grafton County receives a request. That's very similar to the first page here, serving veterans from housing through hospice. So this is what your town would have, your uh, welfare officer or your town administrator would have received, you know, in October. And then as I said, every town has a different system. Bristol says you've got to come and, and talk to our budget committee every year. I do that every year. Warren said, come talk to us once. I did it. They said, you're in. There were some veterans in the room. We love you, and I've never had to get out. So it just really depends on what the town wants to do. Well, for the record, mm -hmm. you don't have to do it every year. If the voters approve it, and if there isn't a change in the amount, mm -hmm. so. Um, but you have to do it in Bristol every year. You do have to do it at least once. So. Yeah. But you do have to submit a petition yeah. every, every year. Right. But so do you have to get those 25 names? You have to get the petition signed, or and I would say try to get 35 to 50 Littleton registered voters to sign the petition. Okay. Because um, that's how you get onto the warrant. Right. And that has to be done every year. But coming and visiting with the Budget committee mm -hmm. may not be a yearly event. Okay, right. but getting those signatures will be. Yes. Okay. That's just every year. Have a every petition year. Champ, a petition on our Okay. Yeah. So anyway, um, Ms. Stubbins is still your welfare officer. Yes. Correct. So um, I, I would suggest um, that if you have any veterans facing homelessness, any people in the military, I don't call them veterans because. Sometimes they don't call themselves veterans. If they haven't gone to war, if they haven't left the country, they don't, cause, so I just say, have you ever been in the military? And that opens the door for the whole military story. But I would suggest that um, <coughs> if they are facing homelessness, if they call down to Rob Norris at Boulder Point and get people on a waiting list because, you know, apartments change hands. And so this is a really incredibly um, beneficial service to any, any former military person who is facing and it, it could be a life-changing experience for them. Any questions from anybody? Originally, we had thought that they were asking for uh, 43, Well, if you look at page two, 25% of 9,400, somebody do the math, is 2,325, <laughs> or, yeah? So you went 25%. So, so originally, and I think that got added to my request for 2000. I'm happy to take what anybody can provide us because we're re working really hard. We've opened two thrift shops because the writing was on the wall years ago with the government and, and freezes and shutdowns. And to tell you the truth, I'd much rather earn the money to support our shelter and our commitment to formerly homeless vets than I am to take government money. Especially if it's federal. Is that what the lady does on Main Street in uh, Plymouth? That's her shop? Is that her? Yeah, that's ours. That's, that's ladders. And who's the lady? Uh, Sue Jell. Sue, yeah. Yep. She's just an energy. She's got a powerful energy. Yep, yep. Yeah. And it's She's good friends. Great. Yep, and we have another thrift store. It's called Flipping Furniture. It's out on Tiny Mountain Highway. It's directly at the base of where the veterans' housing is. So we've been able to hire two people from that um, housing facility. Um, to work down there. We have another Vietnam vet who's a part-time worker. So we're really trying to establish a commitment to veterans. However, if you've been homeless, there's a lot more going on in your life than poverty. It's, there's behavioral challenges, there's mental health challenges. And right now, um, our demographic is just like the state of New Hampshire, which I think is the grayest state now in the country, right? Yeah. And uh, so it looks like I'm running a nursing home. So we do, we've got a, we've got a 70 year old vet who we decided couldn't go to Boulder Point because he really needs an endarterectomy. He's had a stroke, nobody realized it. You know, he's homeless. 
So people don't look that hard, but I'm a nurse. So this, this guy was being treated for frozen shoulder, and I said, he didn't have a seatbelt on. We were driving to a doctor's point. I said, Brian, squeeze my hand. He couldn't squeeze it. He had a stroke. Just had it. No one had recognized it. So anyway, we're very, very committed to this, to this population. We have an extension on the Bridge House. It's permanent support to housing. It's going to open in two weeks, and it will be permanent placement for it. Six people will be living there, and one of them will be Brian, who is, who is the better. So. Any questions? How much you ask for? I ask every town. Um, Andrew, you got the letter, right? And for two thousand. Yeah. Two thousand. Yep. 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 So? Yep. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for coming. Thank you so much. My GPS had no idea where you were. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to get the petition warrant or call the signature scan by what date? Sometime in January, right? We prefer them sooner. But the deadline, the drop dead deadline, is January 14th. January 14th. Yeah, I do have a, a note from you that says January 14th. So we go to Ashland, and we go to the dump. Uh, where do you suggest that we should go to find voters? Transfer station here in Littleton. Walmart. <laughs> okay. You know, if, if you go to some of the, the uh, hospital, maybe. You might catch some veter veterans there uh, that could sign up, or or any voter mm -hmm. in the town of Littleton. Okay. All right. Did you, you bring a petition to bring I, uh, Did you send me word, Karen, for I petition? sent you a sample okay. that, of some other petition that you could use to, okay. to write yours. If anybody has an idea regarding what that should look like, I mean, I listened to it. I thought, oh my goodness, if the airport isn't going to get money, I don't think I could get any money. But it was certainly it was worth asking. Um, and I usually don't push this hard, but with this um, big metric change with the state of New Hampshire, who they opted to fund, so we have 100 bed shelters in New Hampshire. Those shelters, and maybe rightly so, are going to be getting, based on per capita, they're going to be getting the lion's share. What is the nearest shelter to us besides you? There is What's the nearest shelter to you? Carry House in Laconia, and we take people from the Carry House. Um, we are a, what we call a low barrier shelter. So we do not have any comparable shelters in the North Country? Not as far as I know. There's a small birch. You have the Birch House birch in Franconia, yeah. but it's specialized. Yes. Yeah. 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 Tyler Blaine is Whitefield, That's right? Correct. He's closer to Plymouth, but they're pretty closer close. Closer to Plymouth than what? Lancaster. <laughs> oh, it's Lancaster? What is it? It's okay. in Lancaster. Is that closer than Littleton? Yes. It's oh, I closer than Plymouth. I'm on the Veterans Board in Berlin, so this was like a piece of cake, because <laughs> <laughs> I'd still be driving. I, I'm just yeah. trying to get... Um, so we have never, so Tyler Blaine is an eight person shelter. We have never been able to get anybody in that ever. In the 10 years that I've been the director, I've never been able to, to pull so that up. So very small shelters. Yes, it's smaller than us. And, and right now we're doing outreach. So we send one person out into the greater region and we would rather see people in their homes so kids don't become displaced um, and dislocated by changing schools and moving into shelters. So we're providing services in the home. And we've also done that for area military people as well. It might be buying new tires for cars so that person gets to work so they don't lose their job. It's basic stuff. And I really, I think that's a pretty important thing to do. So that's, that's prevention. And we have this hospice space. So I think we're the only shelter with a hospice space. All right, thanks Thank guys. you very much. Thank you for the work you're doing. Because it doesn't look like it's um, always gratifying. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't do it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Andrew and Karen, what do you have for us? All right. Well, we start with the um, treaty war. Do that first. So, 
Oh, this, this is the tax rate of since 1990. Some this way and some that way, and yeah. I think I have 10 of them, so I think I have 40. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what's the last one? Just in the day. Okay. Next time we're passing some additional stuff. Okay, passing around some points that Karen and Skip's answers see if I can work with the Department of Revenue Administration over the past several weeks to come up with and help us try to understand the complex way that we come up with a new tax rate. You know this. You probably don't. One Steve. I just keep one back here for Karen. Oh, right. How do you know what you guys do? Is there an extra history right there? Do you have it? Yeah, I agree. Oh, yeah, I agree. Do you have one? I have one. Okay. Okay. Oops. These are. Some things that we're going to be discussing, so I'm giving you a lot. I realize that. So, uh, first, what you'll notice is the uh, total tax rate. You've probably all got your tax bills by now. Is uh, 2310, which is the same as last year. Um, the, the difference that you'll, you'll notice is that the uh, uh, town and county and school um, all have a significant difference. I mean, you'll see that the the, the town tax rate has gone from seven dollars and ninety cents to four twenty-five, while the school went from eleven sixty-two to fourteen seventy-two, and you can see that there's a, almost an equivalent uh, uh, transfer of those um, those rates. So, so how did that happen, Andrew? So here, here's the, your yeah, here's our short notes. This this uh, right. double-page print sheet. Um, this is something that Karen and Skip Santucci and New Hampshire Department of Revenue. Um, have worked on to try to help us uh, understand. So, uh, NHGRA has completed the tax rate calculation um, and the tax collector approved the tax rate. Uh, the number, uh, as, the, as the board had directed, is uh, going to be stabilized at 2310. Uh, so the RSA allows the state to use imputed values. Um, it's, it's a new statute and it's in place now, but it has in there the word may is in the RSA instead of shall, saying that the town may use an imputed value. So in the case of the Great River Hydro Pilot, uh, the town of Lisbon is different some, than some of the other towns. So, uh, and Karen can correct me if I'm wrong here, but in some towns where they use the imputed value, it really doesn't have an impact on the tax rate because the school district itself is actually a department of the town. So there's not really a separate uh, allocation of value between the town and the school. And so Berlin is an example of that. They have the yeah, Except Berlin is not a town, it's a city. Right, but. Uh, I thought that was the reason that they were structured the way. Because in Berlin, the, the city council actually has to approve the school, the school budget. budget. Right, yeah. So instead of saying we're town, she's we're municipality. So yeah, like in, in, in the municipality of Berlin, which is a city, the school is a uh, department of the town. I think, I, I'm not sure, but I don't know what I'm in Manchester. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I thought it was a city town thing, if you would. I thought that right. in a city form of government that the. That is count, yeah, the council form over, over the school, too. Yes. Right. <laughs> but with that, with that aside, so Littleton is a little bit unique because uh, we, we're a town, we're not a city, right? And we, but we also have a single town school district. So that's a little unique. Most towns are in uh, multi-town. And so when you look at the way the statute reads, it talks about the, uh, the appropriation of the valuation uh, to the school. And then it says, and this is where you know, we're looking at getting in multiple districts, right? So we're, we're, we're a school district of one town. It, uh, they looked at the law a little different. Um, now, Karen's going to go over some scenarios, but what we found when we were working on this with the select board is that if we went ahead and we took the uh, imputed value, so we took the value of, of the pilot, which is $4,059,000, and then we backwards it into the, what the value of the dam would be, which I think uh, we'll go down over here, but like $175 million. Mm -hmm. When you use the DRA number for imputed value, it puts in a much lower figure, and Karen will go over that, but I think it's one around 163 million. 
So when you take that 163 million and you put it into our total pie of valuation, it's smaller, so it actually acts to increase all tax rates. So our tax rate um, would, have, would have likely been somewhere 24 to $25 per thousand. So rather than you know say it's more important to the town to have you know a, a, a equivalent distribution of the tax rate between the county and the school, the select board um, working with uh, the DRA and our consultant said it's, I think it's more important that we have a stable tax rate rather than um, one that's going to jump just so we feel like we've treated the school fairly. Um, and I, I think that you know. Karen, if you want to go through some of the yeah. different scenarios yeah. to show that. Yeah, but our first question, I mean, yeah. if you had a higher tax rate, couldn't you be collecting more money? Yes. That's correct. Right, yes. the overtaxing. Yes. Over yes. Okay, so you're collecting, what would happen with the? It would go, yeah, at the end the of the year, it would go to the, the have extra? Yeah, we both have, we would both have surplus. Yeah, it's, be, it's because I think... It, Actually, the town would be collecting more than it should be. Right. The <coughs> school would collect the same as what they need, mm -hmm. but the town would be collecting more than it should. And the tax rate would go up. I'm going to go through this sheet that I gave you. There's, there's three sheets here. Mm -hmm. The first one is actually what the select board finally or did approve once we reviewed everything. Uh, so this is this says at the very top on the right hand side 2019 draft without using imputed value yes. and this is what was recommended to us by DRA only the first recommendation did not take into account some things the select and decided to do to get that rate down even further original calculation was $23.25 the selectmen chose to use 50,000 of the municipal aid money to reduce the taxes as part of revenue. They also looked at the um, overlay, and that was changed from 150,000 to 100,000. Very minimal overlay. They chose not to use any fund balance at the recommendation of the board here and knowing that we wanted to try to build our fund balance. So I'm gonna go through a couple scenarios. So can you, on the municipal aid, what was the balance and how much did you take out? Uh, the amount that we received was about 122,000. Okay. The selectmen authorized expenditures of a portion of that and decided to use 50,000 okay. to add to revenues to help get the tax rate down. All right. They, their goal in their selectmen meeting was to get the tax rate at the same level as last year's. And that was a new, we, we haven't received that revenue before. Never. Well, Never. I mean, is that comparable to what the school, the same situation that the school has? And will we ever receive it again? We're going to get it okay. one more year, and I can't. Yeah, that's it. So it's, a two year, it's a two-year plan. Yeah, it's a two-year plan. Next year's amount by law has to be put right to the tax rate. Yes. We're not allowed to use it for any expenditures. And you also uh, use a portion of that municipal aid for the restraining chair and what else? The restraining chair and the ballistic system upgrade. Ballistic shield. Ballistic, ballistic shield. shield. Yeah. yeah. Um, I did listen. See, I did listen. <laughs> <laughs> Twenty-five thousand was set aside for the application for the grant for the fire truck because we didn't have matching funds, and that had been included into our fund balance because it's been two years and we didn't have approval on the grant. So the auditors wouldn't let us hold it anymore. We tried. No, that's fine. I, did, I don't want to get you off track, but I wanted to understand the municipal aid and where it came from, and so we all would have that understanding. But just, just so you, <laughs> so you, so the committee understands our thought process was we wanted to uh, use as much of the money as necessary to level the tax rate, not touch the fund balance, and. The rest of it we tried to use for things we knew we were facing spending money on, not on something new. These were all things that were in the proposed budget that, you know, for what like you said, that, that, that we were going to sort of at least get the benefit next year of that and not have new expenditures on it. 
I, I was just trying to make sure too it wasn't from the unexpected fund balance. <laughs> Actually, I have good new, news on that front, but we'll keep going on this. So this is the result of what was the best scenario for the taxpayers. It wasn't, you know, what's the best scenario for the school? What's the best scenario for the town? What was the best scenario for the taxpayers? So the scenario was, and this was DRA's recommendation too, was 2310. They, the original one was 2325. But because of those adjustments that were made during the selectmen's meeting, it came into 2310. That was the goal. And I also want to say um, part of that increase over last year before it was recalculated is because we had a great increase in the county tax. Yes. So that is part of this, what you're doing with the municipal aid is to help offset some of that impact. All right. So looking at the town portion, which is the gray area, it's about one fourth down on the page, the town's adjusted rate because of the added revenue is four dollars and twenty six cents per thousand that's a reduction of three dollars and sixty four cents from last year the school's rate is fourteen seventy two it's an increase of three dollars and ten cents they're not getting any share of the pilot because it's not included the count of the state school rate is a dollar ninety seven that's set by the state. It's not something that the revenues affect at all because they use a different valuation that's down below, and I'll show you where that is in just a few minutes. So they actually have a reduction of 12 cents from last year's rate. The county portion, and this is what Diane has mentioned, the county budget did go up. It's $2.16 per thousand. That's an increase of 66 cents. Their budget went from 1.2 million, if you look at the county portion, to 1.3, almost 1.4 million dollars. And that was not expected. We had no control over it as far as during our budget process. This is something that we may not even know about until after we have our budgets voted in. So this is something that we can estimate. We estimate the best we can. Yeah, but we're not without representation at the county. So we do have uh, elected delegates to the county uh, government, which, <coughs> which are also our state representatives. And then we have a, a drafting, we have county commissioners every event. So that's really where the influence of that budget process uh, should be put in this. So they attend the county commissioner meetings? Yeah, and, and, and budget meetings. They, the, the delegates to the county vote on the budget. Yeah, although it's maybe no, it's questionable how effective some of that could be. And I've been to one of those at the uh, Well, I mean, I mean, obviously there's a lot of people there at the table besides us. So, uh, you know, the influence and interest of Hanover as opposed to the interest and influence of Littleton as opposed to Plymouth. I mean, that's quite a broad range of, of input so how how effective uh, how effective the voicing of your concerns is, is right. I told them that after they built the jail they probably should consider not opening it and then you so historically it's always been pretty close like what you estimate now in the center what it turns out to be. Other than, I never know what the school's going to be until the very end. Yeah. I haven't heard about their budget. County, I have no idea. But I mean, historically, like right now, it's was, it was no, 16. The no, I had no idea it was going to go up this high. The, one of the problems in New Hampshire is everything is kind of out of sync. You know, we do our budget, and then the governor does his budget much later. The county does their budget some other time, and it's never in sync before the voters vote locally. 
But, but what, what is the county doing that accounts for over 30% increase? I can't answer that. <laughs> I need to get the commissioner here, don't I? Or the county commissioner. Well, I'll have to get contact information. That's, that's you. Send contact information. I did, at some point, we'll talk about a little tomorrow and I can go there. So just to go back to the valuations that are used, the proof of rates, just below there, there's a net assessed valuation from the MS1 2019. We have a form that's filled out by our assessors that come up with values, and DRA has to review it and approve it. So one number is the, the $570 million in assessment. That is without utilities. And that is what is used for the state school rate. <coughs> it's how the DRA calculates the school tax rate. They tax the utilities directly using their own valuation. So that's why they're not included as part of that. The number below, 640 million, is the town assessment according to DRA and the MS1, and that is with utilities. At the state rate. At the state valuation. At the state valuation. It does not include uh, more DM. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the title is. Who actually knows? I don't. <laughs> I don't care who owns it. I just <laughs> want to pay. Just do the numbers. <laughs> So, okay, so, okay, so that, that doesn't include any import in, that's all the other utilities at the state rate. Right. Roughly Be $70 million. Dollars. Because more than is included in our revenues, the, the pilot is included in our revenues. So you see the town revenues back up at the top, $14,131,756. That's one reason why the town rate dropped, is because we collected that money in a pilot. Okay. And so in that 14 million is the, what's the, what's the amount we collected this the year? Pilot yeah. was 4,059,000. What was that again? 4,059,000. Okay, so, I mean, so basically, so if it weren't for that, the estimated okay. revenues would have been. I'm going to show you on another page what thing. happens if we back that off. Because when we impute the value, we have to come up. So this is this is what the actual rate is, what's being built. So here I have a draft, the second page in, called example two, is the draft using the state imputed value. And had we used this imputed value, <coughs> it means backing off our pilot and including a valuation the state calculates, which is uh, the $163 million value of data. They have a calculation they do to do that. The town rate would have been $8.92. It would have been a dollar one. The school portion would have been $12.39, that's a 77 cent increase. The state school's the same because their evaluation they use, less utilities, is the same. There's no difference there. The county portion is $1.81, so it's a 32 cent increase. The rate would have been 2509 using the state imputed value. That's $1.98 more. We would have actually collected about $4 million more in taxes because of that. And I don't completely understand, but that $4 million was coming in as the pilot. So the calculation, this is the calculation using the state value. Now we go on to the town imputed value. Uh, Mr. Sansusi and I sat down 
and, and Andrew was there. It, it's a very complicated formula where you take last year's tax rate and break it into the uh, valuation of the dam. You take this the calculation that you would have used for the state and break it in and you come down so that the rate is less than a thousand dollars or the amount of value is less than a thousand dollars from each other. It's two steps. I had to do this calculation seven times to get down to it's bad. It's because what when you have a set cash amount, the value of the dam is act when you compute it is in flux based on the tax rate. So you have to calculate above and below until you, you know, get it right. And uh, I, before you get into that, I just got a general question. Sure. About this. I saw uh, I we already discussed previously the the whole the, the imputed and, and going with the pilot and all this stuff. I understand all that. But what's the value of going through a town imputed value? Are we even allowed to use that? We what's could. The point? If it was in the best interest of the taxpayers. The DRA would let us use that? They would. Because yeah. my, in my mind, I was choosing between the state DRA imputed value and the uh, the 2310 that we we could have pushed for it. Oh, okay. I mean, so we don't know that we would have got it. We don't know if we would get it or not. We yeah, could have I got you. Right. In either of those cases, you were ended up collecting money over and above. Well, we budget. We were too budget. The collection of that money would have been the pilot, the four million dollars. Right. So, so, yeah, we so, 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 so the next year you vote to use those excess funds to drive the tax rate back down? Or, right, that's yeah. what really we could have gone through that exercise. Yeah, exactly. In the meantime, we're gonna fight a $25 tax rate. Yeah, I'm bumping the road. Some of it just obviously doesn't make sense. Okay. So using the town's imputed value, we would have had a tax rate of $24.34. That's $1.25. Dollar twenty-four, excuse me, dollar twenty-four <laughs> more per thousand than uh, what the rate is that we're. So I was getting. I mean, you know, when we, when you at first blush, we gave us numbers six weeks ago, whatever it was, and we were at eighty-three cents or whatever, and then a couple weeks ago we whittled it down to twelve cents, which we couldn't figure out as to how that. I mean, that 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 was all a function of going through this trying to figure out how it was actually going to extrapolate the... My first year, and there was a lot to learn. Oh, yes, I and, uh, appreciate that. It's I should have never thrown a number out there that I... Well, you know, you're not getting criticized for giving us your best off. I mean, it's just... Well, I'm not going to do it again. Well, <laughs> no, 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 but you know what I'm saying? I, I can certainly see there's a thing. Obviously, it's, in many ways, it just doesn't make sense. But, uh, I mean, how we would end up, under any scenario, how would you end up... How would you end up with collecting more money than what you were budgeting for an operating? Yeah, that You're basically taxing the dam twice. Well, they in a way. Well, they wouldn't get taxed. They wouldn't get taxed. The voters. I mean, yeah. yeah, the voters would be yeah. taxed the amount of the dam yeah. while the dam's already paid. Under reserve fund balance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously you can't do this, but in, in simple terms, you think you would, whichever one of those other scenarios you would use. Yeah. Then you would figure out what your actual operating budget was going to be, and it was going to be 88% of what the revenues are going to be. You would just take the uh, you would just take the tax rate, discount it by 12%, and that would be a tax rate. So you'd end up back at 2310 right. anyway. Right. But I'm not saying they would let you do that. But but if you, if you were doing it if you were doing it in real world, I mean, you would obviously figure well, if someone came out 12%. Hi, you just back it down and yep. send the bill. Right. So going forward. Thank you, Jim. Yes. Oh, thanks, Jim. So going forward, we always, you know, at this time of our process, we have this value or this um, total tax base that we know if we go up, spend X amount of dollars, that's a dollar on the tax rate, or it's fifty cents. Do we have that number here? I have it on this. Good. Okay, all right. So, one thing I did want to mention, and I did make copies of this for everybody, but our fund balance, because of some uh, rollbacks back into our fund balance by the auditors, 
our audit is always behind time, so we're not quite sure if they're going to allow us to continue carrying some of the old worn articles. This is 2018 audit. Yes. Right. So we have a Dell stamp that we haven't hadn't expended anything out of for a year. There hasn't been a lot of mute movement on it. Um, there's a lot of questions on what we need to do to get that going again and how much it's going to cost. So the auditors made, roll, made us roll back into the fund balance 105000 plus change. Um, so that added to the fund balance. We had to roll back an energy opera house expenditures that was supposed to be part of a grant. That added 34000 back into fund balance. We had to do the fire truck because that's been two years. We've been trying to get a grant. We have not been approved. It's 25000 We had to roll back the opera house rigging because that has carried more than two years. And we have movement, but we haven't paid anything out yet. And there was no invoice to pay anything out. And there may not be till the beginning of the year. So we're going to have a warrant article to bring some of that money back to do that project. Um, so that rolled back in 15000 We did have revenues more than the budgeted revenues, which help add to the fund balance. And I, when I estimated revenues this year, I believe I estimated extremely tight, trying to get that tax rate to, to be level. Tight meaning high. I estimated a little high, but I generally. believe we're going to get there. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, in line with our over collection. Yeah. Uh, if there's Last a window, year, we're on the top. We had $160,000 more. Concerned. Part of that was some pilots that we were able to do with different entities. Yeah. So we collected $160,000 more than what the overall estimate was. I'm estimating this stuff in September. Right. I reviewed again the end of October with DRA. I have no prediction. If I had a prediction that far out, I'd be buying stocks. And <laughs> I wouldn't be working here. That's a Microsoft board <laughs> so, um, And then we had about 94000 between old encumbrance balances. Worn articles didn't get fully expended because we saved money on them. You know, different other things. It was 94000 we have a fund balance as of the end of 2018 of $728,000. Drum roll. We're about 500000 It's uh, <laughs> $12,000. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. And, and keep in mind that some of these things, for example, the Dells River, I mean the Dells Dam, that's a red listed dam. And we do have to come up with a solution. And we will need those funds for engineering. So that'll be something that we're working on this year and we'll have a more article for next year to probably pull that back out. Not 2020. Right, 2020. 2020. Yeah. Um, we did have a vote to use out of fund balance $9,000, $9,011. We have an overlay of $100,000. So we have $619,000 left after that solid minus out. So go back. Do you understand what the overlay is? I'm Do you just going to ask for the definition of both the overlay and the fund balance. Okay, would you please? Well, the fund balance is basically money's left over after all the books are closed and all the bills are paid, and um, it's money that hopefully the town can hang on to so that it doesn't have to borrow a tan. Um, usually, twice a year, we ask the selectmen to do a tan because we're billing after the fact. We have a bu budget that's voted in. We've already expended money from January to March, and we continue to spend money until the tax bills go out, half of the tax, of course, in June, July, they might go out. And that fund balance helps keep us from having to borrow money. You're supposed to try to have at least two months worth of expenditures. When the school bills come in, the school bills are around 450000 every two weeks. So there's 800000 That's just school in a month's time. 
So that's a so cash flow in your checking yeah, accounts. Yeah. Like the prop, like if we were a business, it'd be the profit margin. We just don't have it allocated to anything else for the next year. It's so yeah. so good cash flow. Um, Money that's been raised but not committed to yeah. anything specific. Right. <coughs> so. But it does help with that cash flow, and it helps in emergencies. That's what the DRA recommends if you have it at eight percent. Uh, We're right about three point four percent with this fund balance, which is the best we've right. been for a very long time. Um, we have a proposal at this point to pull out forty-five thousand as part of the Warren articles for some of these things that were folded back in that we need to pull back out. And on these Warren articles, I'd like to put non-lapsing until, so that we don't have to go through this battle again with with the auditors on what we can hold over longer or not. Did, did you um, explain overlay? No, I didn't. Overlay is, oh, thank you, is people are coming in about their assessment. They say their property's been assessed and they don't agree with it. And they feel that they have a good battle against it. They file a paperwork to uh, abate their taxes, abate their property values. And we have to hold aside money every year to what we think are going to be um, abatements. So refunds. Refunds. For errors of assessment. Who no. arbitrates that? Who, who determined? The Board of Assessors. So they use a consulting firm, uh, KRT, oh. to make recommendations. And so the select board also has a hat as Board of Assessors. And then if uh, the person appealing the, or evading the taxes doesn't agree with the Board of Assessors' decision, then they have the right to appeal it to the Board of Tax and Land Appeal or to Superior Court. Um, and then that's where a final decision can be made. So. Um, and, and, and paying for all that is supposed to all come out of the oh, yeah. of the overlay. So even legal expenses that would be attributed to those uh, cases would come out of that. Um, and then the amount that goes in there depends on what's happening that year. So for example, like it was last year, we did our uh, full town statistical revaluation. And so um, whenever you revalue everybody's property, you're going to find errors. You're going to you know find people who disagree and. Um, so we had a higher value last year. We had 150 or 200? 200. 200. We had 250 yeah. last year. And so whatever was remaining from the overlay. So where does so, the overlay yeah, where come, come from? Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's a, that's a it's set aside. It actually gets, if you look at your tax rate sheet, mm -hmm. okay. you're going to see that if you add back in the overlay. So when we build out for taxes, that's part of that it's added back into the cost of the town. You know, when the board sits down to set the tax rate, so what they just did with this 23, to get us to the 23 10, that's one, there's multiple consideration. One is use of fund balance, and then the other is uh, overlay. Yeah. Is How overlay is those separate from fund balance? It's not in fund balance, is it? It's not in fund balance, no, it's actually, it has to it's, be set aside. Right, 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 but it's like two, it's like two separate savings accounts there. Yes. Or contingency yes. accounts, if you would, right? Well, I mean, it doesn't, from year to year, it does not build up, correct? No. Yeah, so if the board, when the board makes a decision to add overlay, yeah. they're adding that as an expense, basically. In your tax budget. In that year. In that, in that, in that given right. year. So okay. then if, it, if it's collected and unused, then that could go into the, uh, the uh, oh, um, fund balance. So, so it could be folded over into fund balance if it's not used. And then right, but, but it also could just sit where it is. It could. Yeah. It could. Okay. It depends so, on the auditors. Right. Okay. Because when you okay, when you had the fund balance up to seven hundred twenty-eight thousand dollars, but then you minus out of that the over hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. I guess I didn't really understand. Okay. Why. I minus out of it the hundred thousand dollars because we're going to have tax bills next year that will be abated we still have abatements going on right but we have a balance in the overlay account at the end of this year we will have a small balance because we've already expended as of the tax rate setting we had already expended eighty nine thousand okay so virtually the overlay was gone yeah so we had to create a new overlay yeah, so we almost have to create it every year right. yes well that would be created every year I mean, 
You add money to it. You add money to it if you have some known abatements or legal um, issues with BTLA, you would add to it. Well, this year we added less because we last year we had the statistical rebound, so we expected there might be more. Yeah, I mean, there's court cases out there, but we have no idea when they'll Okay. okay, so basically, out of out of our fund balance, we're moving a hundred thousand dollars to overlay. Yeah, we yeah. want to make sure right. that it. What is the um, recommended amount in overlay? overlay? Is there one? There's a maximum, and it's based on your budget every year. Um, we probably could have, if we wanted to, put in over seven hundred thousand. At, at one time, overlay. Karen, if you remember when we were having our discussion with regards to the dam valuation however many years ago, we had maxed out. Yes. The old, because we knew at some point in time there was going to have to be a settlement. And I think, we, but we had maxed out. We would have put more in, but I think we couldn't because there wasn't, there wasn't a maximum to it. Right. All right. Any questions <coughs> on that? Uh, yeah. 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 No. It's <laughs> there as much, right? Was <laughs> <laughs> so you saying you still put it in the fund balance and then transferred it when you needed it? I think it was a. I think you can, no, uh, you, can, you can get up to 12 years. We were able to encumber the overlay and continue because we had that lawsuit happening. I understand, but if you lose the limit of that, could yeah. you put it in the fund balance? It's and a then, limit every year. Yeah, right, but yes, and yeah, you, could, you could have also increased the fund balance at the same time, which maybe we did do that yeah. too. I can't remember. You'd have to ask any more. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it doesn't matter at this well, point. Just, yeah, but yeah. yes, yeah, you could have created your own yeah. separate, if you would, yes. Just one, one question on clarifying this this overlay amount, who who actually recommends that amount every time there's a revaluation? Is it is it an arbitrary type based on the assessors or Yeah, we would we would work with uh, the different consultants to figure and out they would what recommend that amount. And plus past history too. Okay. Like Karen's and those Recommended. from past history of when you do a, a uh, reval, here's how much we've seen in the past. Yeah. I think past history would, okay. be, a, would be a bigger player. Mm -hmm. Myself. Mm -hmm. How many cases you are complaining about KRT? If you remember. I don't have you have complaints? Complaints. People want to reassess the problem. Oh, you mean abatement? Abatements? Yeah. yeah. I mean. Remember the number we had? 20, 30, 40, 50? Mm -hmm. I'd say probably 50 is a... 50 around 50 because... Okay, that's all right. That's a guess. And they can range from $100... Yeah, it could be something as small as, yeah, I've, yeah, I've seen 100 or less even, yeah, yeah. to, I mean, recently we had one that had an error and it was uh, maybe $1,000. But, but that kind of happens really in two phases, right? The, the first phase is coming in and questioning the bill. And, yeah. yeah. And, then it's kind of looked over to make sure if there's any obvious mistake that was made then whatever mm -hmm. which then it re results in adjustment the right. 50 would be when somebody said i don't really agree with this you guys need to take a closer look at it yeah and they, sometimes somebody will come in with an independent market analysis of their property okay. and there's no error you know based on the state's formula it's just they get a they get a better better market analysis that uh you know you can't disagree with them. Sometimes that's, that's the case. But someone can, you know, you don't have to wait for a revaluation here. If you do have an error that's on there, like for example, a wrong size debt, or it says you have three bedrooms and you have two, those kind of things you can come in and uh, work with an assessor on, I think. Uh, and those usually get, those get right So when you make those changes in the middle of the year, any time, well, you, well the, I know that the data will be corrected and reflected on your next tax bill. But will the value will actually be changed too? I have to ask our assessors. Yeah. yeah. I don't think we'll give you discount on the bill. No, I understand. I understand. Yeah. That question came up with today. It's not retroactive, right? Yeah. 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of process into going into calculating the tax rate. It's not just yeah. one piece of paper, there is so many pieces. <laughs> Uh, so many report. different reports, uh, you know, and so many different things to look at to come up with those numbers. Yeah, to even behind just, you know, just the revenue is the MS uh, 232. Uh, MS 535, 535 is the revenues. And then we have the 434. And the school has their own. The 232. 
Yeah, and then we use a slew of different revenue files that then generate, and then that results into now you have your MS1, which takes the value of 50. So, what else do you have for us? Okay, do you, how much time do you want to hand it out? Yes. Yes. I think this, and this is after this is the results of your. Yes. It is, well, I won. Is the chair. Um, there, there's a couple of things that we specifically do not decide because we want to get your feedback from them. Is, what was the, what's the purpose of the following tax rate? We heard that there's, the, the tax rate on every post now, and we heard that shows that it's gone up and down over years. Actually, this uh, 2018 and 2019 are the mid-level. I went through and did a kind of a quick <coughs> snapshot, and we're about uh, 15, about halfway, midway on the tax rate from what it's the highest and the lowest. Yeah. The missing component though is town valuation. That you really right. Yeah, that, that'd be another. Uh, we had we right. somebody who yeah. came to town and joined the budget committee one year and said, what are you complaining about the tax rate? It used to be $35 and now it's down to, you know, 20. That's when the town was valued at half what it is today. So, yeah. right. um, but then well, you really need that to pull it together. Right? Yeah, so, so, so that's a recommendation, right? Yeah. So you might want to write that down to put the valuation on this, on this one. Yeah, yeah. And add another column. Just nice to look at a snapshot and say, this year is not the highest tax rate. Well, and it's not the lowest either. But the, the valuation to I mean, a tax base, um, that's really important to me because you, you can squeeze blood out of a penny as much as we try to right around here, but there's so many other factors, and it's it's called growth, you know. And are are we doing everything we can do to grow the town in ways that are beneficial to the town, or it is beneficial to the town? Um, we had what was Brian's group committee, the um, not the industrial park, but the, for economic. Yeah. development yeah. you know and we we had that a group of people came together and, and formed that committee and it really helped bring in and develop Littleton and then it kind of phased out and now we I think we need to kind of really yeah. bring it back again so you see the benefits if, if we had that column there you would see the benefit the correlation the other column that might be important <coughs> is the town budget and the school budget yeah. because those play a factor even county yeah. budget play a factor in the yeah. tax rate no, so we'll have true. a spreadsheet going this way <laughs> <laughs> yeah jerry you're going to go to uh you know, <laughs> get on my free time <laughs> yeah pay the ram and that's fortunate <laughs> yeah I had, I had approached brian and i think you maybe even seen a while back about the concept of creating either like a community development corporation or an economic development corporation. Um, I think, you know, LIDC has done a great job of the industrial growth, and you can see that we're at capacity in place to make that growth, but we don't really have to do now specifically focused on commercial or even residential development. So, you know, at some point, well, the other chart that, yeah, the other chart that you bring to us that really is important is, um, Growth and, and it's a chip. where it's chip coming from. Pay so pay the industrial park, commercial industrial park was one area, <coughs> but it was mostly the industrial park that was helping that area grow. And then yet was housing, and then you have manufacturing, housing, multiple, uh, multiple. Yeah, yeah, the, the color code we had is yeah. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, you had yeah, yeah, industrial, you had commercial, and you had residential. And you had their manufacturing is separate in there as well. In a land use, land use, <coughs> land use um, right out for residential, mm -hmm. like you said, but commercial and industrial is together. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So we could break, if we wanted to, we could create our own reports using the, our tax maps just based on you know, the zone, uh, industrial versus. Well, not just that, you can use your land use code, you can map the land use too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. 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 We can go beyond what the MS1 has for the you know, value value changes. Well, and I guess maybe that was, you know, why I think it's so important is because at one time we just hung our hat on the dam. Mm -hmm. You know, the dam is our savior, mm -hmm. basically. And then we went up and down with the dam valuations and we went through lawsuits and we went through everything else like that. And it was, I think, two years ago when you had that chart, it showed that the industrial park really saved our mm -hmm. bus. But. Yeah. on it. Um, it. It softened what when the utilities went down that um, they went up in uh, the value. So that really saved us. And I think that's really important because when you're trying to promote the industrial park, people have to understand what a critical role that plays. But it's not just the industrial park, it's also commercial. So the economic development is also important. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, I mean, that, I, I'm all for economic development, I, you know, I, I, I support your, your, your I don't want to call premise. it theory, your yeah. premise there. Um, but, but the idea that we can keep commit com or keep more, commit more human capital to stuff like that is, we don't have the human infrastructure to do that. If, what you're talking about sounds great. We, sh we should be, what I think we should be considering the economic development coordinator, something like that, rather than if, if that's an important thing to us. Uh, here, because here. because there's just no way with our current yeah. staffing we could anybody can bite off more than what's what's going on. I totally agree with you on that, and, that, and but we have to recognize how uh, important it is, and then yeah. figure out how we can do it. Exactly. And, you know, exactly. I'll give you an example. I mean, the return on investment on economic somebody doing economic development is you know you you make up their salary over and over every year. So I spend Friday afternoons right now using the Buckley Analytics to talk directly with um, <coughs> developers or you know franchises who could develop either develop down the meadow or in other commercial areas. And you know we already see movement happening and a lot of them you don't want you can't talk about ahead of time. But and they may not come into fruition but there's a lot of work and research and conversations and just like seeing that has happened in order to get a couple of deals to happen. And you know having somebody dedicated to that I think is important instead of me spending two to three hours a week, you know, doing that stuff. Um, that's why, just one, one more comment, Karen, sorry. But that's why at the very beginning of our process, I'm always asking, um, has, has the tax base grown? You know, because that's important. We, we can try to squeeze this, you know, as tight as possible, but it's a balance between all of those. And if we don't have that balance and we don't ask the questions, you know, we we have to ask the questions, and I'm trying to get better at asking questions. But anyways, you're on. Okay, this big sheet is uh, updated since yesterday. Um, there's a, a couple of since last night. There's a couple little tiny tweaks to it at this point. I'm going to ask you to flip it over. We're going to look a little bit at numbers together and then we'll go back to individual things. So the 2019 actual tax rate for the town is $4.25. The estimated default budget plus all the Warren articles as of this point is $4.72 per thousand. That's the difference of $0.47 per thousand. The actual tax rate for 2019 again is $4.25. The estimated <laughs> proposed budget with all the Warren articles is $5.083. That's a difference of 0.833 cents. And that's if the valuation stays exactly the same as what it is right now. The difference between the default and the proposed is 36 cents. So currently, the tax rate is 23.10. So if you look to the right of that number, with the default amount, it's a 47 cent increase. It would be 23.57 if the valuation stayed the same. So in the proposed, with the proposed and all Warren articles, would be 83 cents. So the tax rate would be 23.93. 
Yeah. That's where the 83 cents came back. You were a year ahead of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of a quick snapshot. Then you've got your individual Warren articles. The top piece explains how we came up with that $4.721. Uh, the next, that's the default, using default numbers, plus all of the approved Warren articles with default numbers. The uh, <coughs> second piece to this is the total proposed budget and Warren articles and the tax impact. This includes the EMS, um, re starting the revolving fund account, plus adding EMS to the operating budget as, and starting that revolving fund so that we will have an EMS. So the estimate there is the $5.083, which I refer to on the back. Now you have individual warrant articles. Public Works Lease Purchase. This is where we're hoping to buy, and I have the, the one that was decided on um, at last night's meeting that we were going to try to do. This, this is where we're trying to do a three-year catch-up Instead of trying to get everything all at once, <coughs> just lots of extras there, I'm sure. Keep going this way, if anybody yeah, else. Yeah. Um, okay. Part of this, though, with the three year, is that the dam will be paid yes. off yes. next year. Yes. So that's part of it. Yes. So this is right. option two. This was the option two that was presented to the selectmen. Um, if you look at this sheet, I have in a square, it says current payment on Trans Canada. So in 2020, our final payment in the budget is $465,664. So on this plan, we're going to have a warrant article that's going to ask us to allow us to buy three at least pieces of equipment, totaling $515,000. We want to do a three year lease on that, lease purchase, not a bond, lease purchase, to break the payments down. In the first payment on this first bond, will, or not bond, lease, will start in 2021. So there won't be any payment in 2020. Then in 2021, we want to purchase $520,000 worth of equipment. We do want to start that payment that year. So we'll have three years on that. And I'll explain a little bit further down why we're trying to stabilize the numbers. So in 2021, there'd be two payments, Karen? Is there would be two payments. Be okay. the first payment for 2020 and the first payment for 2021. Yes. In 2021. And then uh, 2022, we'll have $426,000 worth of equipment. That is our three-year catch-up. But that will be... Uh, um, yeah, I didn't put it on here. I guess I got, got to, I missed that one. Yes, I did. So I've got to recalculate that. Um, but the plan was, was to try to have the payments, including putting some money in the capital reserve account, match up to about four hundred to 450000 so those three years, those first three years, the goal was to try to have the payments plus the equipment and put aside a little bit of money into capital reserves so when we got ready to start buying equipment, we would have funds available to purchase them instead of taking leases out or taking a bond out. So the goal is, that if you look across this double line on the bottom, is to try to have that amount pretty close to the same running all of these years for the next 10 years. To try to, the goal is to try to keep it right around 325 <coughs> to 300, 
and 50,000 no, to thanks. stabilize it. And to be able to withdraw from it when we get to a point where like 2030, we have 80,000, $800,000 worth of equipment that we'll need to buy. We'll be pulling 500,000 from the capital reserve will be able to purchase outright 300,000 of that equipment and put a little bit of money in the capital reserve. So it's to keep building our capital reserve and pull from it when we're doing these big purchases so it stabilizes that equipment purchase. Now, and it will help stabilize the tax rate because this is one of the bigger items these pieces of equipment are one of the bigger items in Tom Warren articles. There would be, if something happened, a Warren article was voted down to buy some of this equipment, we would have to do a catch up on it at some point. But that, that would be a wrench that we would have to work out and it might be on the next year's. But this is an effort to all right, we have the, the transfer or the Trans Canada payment will be paid off in 2020. Now it's time to start catching up on all those things that we've let go. So 2020 is the last payment. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and by doing this, we want to try to keep the payments a level number. Okay, so it's not just equipment that we have to catch up on. So I'm not trying to throw, you know, a wrench at this, but it isn't just the equipment. That just a little cold water. Oh, yeah, a little cold water here. <laughs> um, as we have the, what is it, sub area two and five and all of those good projects that we Six have to do. Yeah, <laughs> all those projects that we have to do. Um, we have our facilities pretty much in order, I think, you know public works and you know no police we're, we're for the most part don't we yeah uh, well you know we at some point we need to figure out our uh, rental car presence you know oh yes right right yes yeah. so, yeah, yeah. so the long neglected yes all i'm saying is we have kind of concentrated on the equipment. on equipment so that's all i'm saying so now i'll let you Run with that. Okay, so. I mean, I could just speak a little bit to that. So one thing on like sub area two, for example, <coughs> right now we're in a holding pattern with that. Uh, what we're trying to do is uh, look at alternative uh, grant funds that are out to get us back to the uh, mix that was approved by the warrant because the USDA grant came in at 8% and it to be at 45. So right. we're, we're probably a year or so out to be able to make that happen. But it's, yeah, it's out there. Yeah. It's, I, I just want you to not forget those other yeah. things. Yeah, well, yeah, it was, that's obviously it's something that came up in our discussions too. But, I mean, the, 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 the more dam payment going away doesn't give us enough money to catch up on everything without having mm -hmm. money somewhere. Yeah. We don't know what's coming. We've got, you know, this, I think one, an important point is we've got, uh, this is based on current valuations. We know that's going up, uh, so that's going to help some. I mean, just the, we're revaluating some big ticket properties already, and we've got a new property just that's going to be coming on the tax rolls. I mean, that, I understand. I, mean, I just wanted yeah. to just kind of put that on the table too. So, and I still, I still, you know, the little camera's running. I still believe that. Um, not the first year, because it's the first year, but I still believe in the, in the long run, the second, third, maybe fourth year, no, I bet you the, by the third, maybe the second year, um, some of our equipment needs um, that are, uh, that we face with our uh, fire, et cetera, will be covered from revenues through, from the EMS. Uh, I, I truly believe that that's actually gonna, in another year, start generating cash, not costing taxpayer money. Wow. So, but we don't know that. We, we can't address it until the time comes. That's why we have a pilot program. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the other thing too, there's another meeting going on tonight and that might be, right, so uh, it might influence what we're talking about tonight. But also, 
think about equipment that you could be asking for on that one. And there's like <laughs> safety oh, measures. Oh, yeah, is there a zoning meeting happening right now? I'm planning on going to. Yeah. Uh, there's a large crowd gathering right now, so. Well, I think there's quite a million. Millions. Well, anyways. Um, quite a bit of negative. Yeah. So it is almost 6.30. Um, do, so we have a meeting. We should have a meeting next Tuesday um, for agenda setting on that. Um, I was hoping that we could really dig into and finalize it. So if we could, if we need to have pizza next next week, we can have pizza. Yeah, so, providers. Can we talk about one? So, so, yeah, you said you, yeah, yeah. There, there, there's, there's three warrant articles in particular. They're great. Uh, yeah, they're great on the list here. That the selectmen, uh, we, the discussion became, we had all these establishing these separate capital reserves. So the discussion uh, came up about why do we have three Warren articles, three separate capital reserves, why don't we have just one capital reserve fund? Because it's all for equipment, uh, even though it's different departments. So we went back and forth on that, discussing that, and the end result was we were really interested, in, not necessarily tonight, but we were really interested in what the what the uh, budget committee's position on their opinion on that is. And if you had, like, I mean, we first approached this a couple of months ago, or have you had occasion to have a conversation with I or Frank about this? Well, the capital you? reserve. Okay. No, yeah. I've been talking about it for years. Well, I know. Well, we, we have too, and, yeah. and and I can't tell you all the intimate details of it. But the last time that this was proposed, there was some significant pushback, and I don't want to be the one to give you the full right. rendition of that. But I think you need to reach out to a few community okay. leaders yeah. about yeah. if there's any holes in this. Yeah, uh, we can address. Yeah, that's right, ahead of time. And I, and I think, the one thing I will say is, I think that the biggest pushback was a lack of confidence that they would be used correctly. I think that was the, I'm, I'm Well, I think the plan is, at least right now, the plan was that to expend the funds, you had to go to town meeting. So I wouldn't... Okay, I'm, I'm just saying, I think you would have had a discussion just ahead of time. Hopefully let's that's just, a, Let's just find out what, if there's any today and you yeah, know, I'll talk with, I, mean, I think at some point the, the voters have to consider you know they hire a board of selectmen and uh, have, a, have a budget committee that they can trust to look at these things and you hire you spend good money and hire professionals to actually administer this program and we've also been told to run the government like a business but if we're micromanaged to the point where we can't then you create a, a you can run like a business but ask them for it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. This way. Yeah. 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 That's right. I, I know. I know. And, but you know, that's yeah. but that's part of the little thing. And you know, yeah. I, I'm just I'm just saying. I, I, I would have I would have a little broader discussion just to make sure there's I nothing think, lurking out there. I think we're pretty much to the end of yeah. where we're at, except for like going up through the Warren articles mm -hmm. and maybe through the operating budget. And so. I guess maybe if any of you have any areas of concern, if you could just forward those to me. And so I, I always appreciate having that information prior so we can hand it off and they can explore the answers with the department heads. So if you have anything in the oper proposed operating budget or, or in the Warren articles, I know that you, I'm assuming the department heads will be here next Tuesday to maybe, maybe, I don't know, you don't have to be, but I mean, you probably will be. Um, you usually are um, to uh, answer any of our questions, but if you have any of those questions prior to next Tuesday, please share them with us so we can share it with them. So, and um, last but not least, we are still on for tomorrow night. Um, school, school. SAU 84 conference room, if you know where that is on Maple Street. Oh, it is not in the academy here. It's in, it's it's in the conference room. Okay. Uh, four to six. I have not heard um, about the rescheduling of last week's meeting. Remember I was saying it might be for Thursday night. I haven't heard anything from them. So I have no idea. So. Stay tuned. <laughs> That's all, all right. I can say. But please come tomorrow night. That should please be a very important meeting. Yeah. And we don't know if, we, for a chance, we might have a meeting on Thursday with the school. Yes. Yeah. 
Right. We do not know. Yeah. Um, I didn't want to contact them today because I want to cancel for tomorrow. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, everybody. Yeah, so, Given the one we will be canceling tomorrow. Yeah. This was a very interesting read, and I really appreciate all the work that was done to get this study done. Yeah, it was. It's. There's a lot of just there was a lot of information that we didn't include in there because we couldn't make direct comparisons, um, and we wanted to make direct comparisons. We learned a lot of interesting ways of um, educating students by talking to the other school districts. Unfortunately, we were doing the study during the summer, and many of the counterparts that we needed to talk to in the other school systems were on vacation, so you had to wait for them to come back. And then all of a sudden, it's the beginning of a school year, and they didn't have time to really. But so you could probably take this to another level, but we just did. By the time we were done, we were pooped. So, anyways, so thank you. Yeah. Meeting adjourned, sir? There's nothing else that. Uh, no. Okay. Would you expect to be voting um, at the next meeting on articles? I would think that we should be able to. I'm, I'm, the reason why I'm hoping we can is because you have a lot of work after this. <laughs> and, you know, I think we can get a general, hopefully, we can get a general idea of what's happening on the school side. And, you know, as much as we don't want to take away from the town because of a school issue, it, it's still a coordinated effort. And um, so, Stay tuned, that's all I can say. If you're planning on voting on the Warren articles the next meeting, then that kind of, that, that kind of decides then on the- For you guys, yes. On, well, on the three versus one capital reserve account, that pretty much yeah. decides it then. Which is fine. Now, if you get a legal opinion today, which you may not have been able to see it, I think that's- I don't see it. it. Um, they, you can, it sounds like do three, but um, the New Hampshire Municipal Association attorney said that or one, but the National Association recommends that you do three separate. Okay. And they had a series of reasons why that were pretty practical, but. Just add that to the list of yeah. things I'm wrong about. <laughs> <laughs> Did you write that as a question? Yeah, that was <laughs> 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 <laughs>